Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Scanlon. I am the director of the Center for Water Policy. And for those who I haven't met before, um, uh, this is a, the first event that the center is hosting right now at the School of Freshwater Sciences. So thanks for attending this. Uh, I joined the faculty of the School of Freshwater Sciences in January, and I am the only law professor who's part of this faculty of mainly scientists and economists. So we are an eclectic bunch. Um, and for those who aren't part of the school and just um, having, having you, we're wel we are welcoming you today to our internal event. Uh, and, and we're happy to have some special. No, just, uh, no um, we're talking about the area of concern uh, cleanup in Milwaukee Estuary. This is an enormous project for our local area, but it's also part of a larger regional effort. Uh, this is connected to uh, the entire Great Lakes region and the US Canadian Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in the late 1980s identified and defined areas of concern that as significant impairments uh, within the Great Lakes region. And they identified 43 of these areas throughout the region that needed to be cleaned up. 26 still remain to be restored. Um, and this Milwaukee estuary is one of them. So we're, we are kind of at the threshold of, uh, of working on something that is regionally significant and of course is going to have big local implications for us as well. Uh, today we have Brennan Dow talking with us. He got his MS uh, from the School of Freshwater Sciences in 2018 and from that was able to um, obtain a job, get his foot in the door at the Wisconsin DNR and today is the Milwaukee Estuary Area of Concern Coordinator. So uh, please join me in welcoming him and I'm gonna turn it over to him to give a talk and then we'll have a discussion um, for the remainder of the hour to a time to ask him questions and also um, give him some feedback on where we think uh, the science and monitoring could be helpful in this process. So Brennan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate being able to come and uh, talk at least with everyone virtually today um, at my computer desk in my basement. Um, so if you hear any, you know, laundry machines going off or uh, space heater kicking on, just, just don't worry about it. I'll keep talking. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about the Milwaukee AOC, as, as Melissa noted. Um, one of the things I think it's important to think about um, when you're thinking about Milwaukee as an area as a whole um, that Melissa also references. It's, it's even though the area of concern has a unified and, and specific boundary in Milwaukee um, that we're able to work within and get funding to help address impairments, um, it also stems out larger than that into the Milwaukee River Basin watershed. So um, even though these area, these issues are specific to um, our boundary, there's also a larger effort um, through our partners at with the Wisconsin team and our others that are doing work throughout the watershed um, to address similar issues. So with that, I will get into the presentation. Um, so here's a layout of the presentation. Uh, I think hopefully everyone um, on this call today uh, knows a little bit of an area, what an area of concern is, but just in case you don't, we're gonna go quickly through that and talk through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, what is a beneficial use impairment, how do you remove beneficial use impairments? What is a management action? And ultimately the goal is to delist an area of concern. And then finally going more specifically into the Milwaukee estuary area of concern, talking about our partnerships, uh, planning efforts and some projects that are going on. And then talking about kind of that science-based decision-making and how um, the area of concern program is known for how science-based decisions can, can kind of uh, create actions as part of that, which is uh, very rare in, in this type of work. So it's, it's actually been able to uh, 
be a cause and effect for other projects within the basin that people kind of want to follow that same process of understanding. Um, so, and then finally, we'll go to talk about questions and discussion. So with that, we will get started. Um, so originally, um, way back in the 19, early 1900s, um, there was a Boundary Waters Treaty um, that was agreed upon between, the, between Canada and the US to resolve disputes over the use of water. Um, through that treaty, the International Joint Commission was established. Um, being able to oversee um, all of the uh, agreements and future work that will be done between kind of a, a binational, um, binational regulations. Uh, the Clean Water Act afterwards, as everyone probably knows, uh, established in 1972 around the same time as part of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was primarily uh, focused on originally on uh, phosphorus loading and reducing algal blooms within the Great Lakes. Um, and then it was amended um, in 1987 to include, include remedial action plans for areas of concern, which is a way in which states and those that are implementing the work um, at the local level to be able to um, show progress being made but also being able to communicate the work that's being happened, that is happening within the area of concerns um, and what the future looks like from a year to year basis and tracking that over time. Um, so with that, through that 1987 amendment, these are at least the US Great Lakes area of areas of concern. Um, as Melissa, Melissa mentioned, there's 26 uh, remaining, um, but originally there was 26 in the US as a whole and 17 in Canada, uh, five of which um, we have within Wisconsin specifically. Um, we, in 2020, we are actually able to delist our first area of concern at the lower Menominee River. Um, that was a, a big accomplishment and definitely something that we wanna continue to do within Wisconsin um, as this program moves further. And so one of the things that I think is really important to note when talking about area of concerns is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, also known as the GLRI. And so this was a big catalyst in 2010 when it became, uh, when it was approved and official that uh, it could be a non-regulatory program that provides funding to address goals and objectives that are outlined uh, within the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and some of the annexes that they have within there. And so as part of that, as part of the GLRI, um, there's five different focus areas. And so when we're talking about areas of concern, it's one of those five focus areas. And so if you think about it kind of like a pie chart, um, area of concerns from a year to year basis normally get a larger chunk of that money uh, allocated towards them, but that is distributed along among federal partners as well as states um, throughout all the Great Lakes Basin. So even though there is funding available every year, it is usually prioritized and distributed based on uh, the progress that's being made, but also um, kind of what is needed um, from a high priority status at all these different areas of concerns. And so one of the things also that it did was it really addressed impairments. So I don't know if you can see that chart, it's not really meant to see what the numbers stand for, um, but the, the red circle there highlights uh, the start of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in 2010. And then the graph kind of shows how many impairments have been removed since then. So when areas of concern were designated uh, severely degraded you know, areas throughout the Great Lakes, it was really hard to kind of do your projects and address your impairments. Um, but now since the GRI was uh, launched in 2010, there's been 90 impairments that have been removed um, as of this past January. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see the progress that's been made over a short period of time. Um, so going on, I, I know I talked about impairments, so we're gonna talk about those now. Um, so what is a beneficial use impairment? Um, a beneficial use impairment is basically an impairment to your waterways or the area surrounding the waterways that makes it so the public isn't fully able to use or enjoy the resource. So if you think about it like, you know, urbanization and removing of wetlands and filling of wetlands and uh, way back when before the Clean Water Act, when there was pollution dumped into 
our rivers and people weren't able to drink the water. Um, those are the types of things that you're that you would think about kind of those legacy issues um, when you think about a beneficial use impairment and so all of the area of concerns have the potential of when they were designated to have 14 beneficial use impairments that are listed on the right. Um, I'll go into how many Milwaukee has in a little bit, um, but I think a majority of those impairments um, normally are addressed by cleaning up legacy material, which I'll talk about later as well. So how do you remove them? How do you no longer have them uh, as being an impairment for your area of concern. And so there's a process that's involved. <laughs> this is a very basic diagram of all the, the arrows in between those different steps that need to happen. But you, you normally establish a removal target. And so the target will say, when you get to this threshold for this impairment, whether it is quantitative or qualitative, you need to be able to show that you can remove it. It needs to be what we call smart objectives. It needs to be um, specific, measurable, meaningful, achievable, and uh, timely as well within the AOC program timeframe. And so that's kind of where your target gets established. And so to determine the status of your BUI after you establish your target, you do monitoring and assessing work. And so you do surveys, you do investigation, uh, you poke holes in the ground, you go out and, and do, you count birds, you, you uh, measure wildlife and habitat types throughout your AFC, determine what that status is. And then depending on your status and your criteria, you work with stakeholders, um, including technical stakeholders and other groups, uh, to develop a list of projects or what we refer to in the AOC program as management actions. And so those management actions then um, after you're able to implement all of them, you're able to then go back and to verify, verify your measures of success. So if you said, these projects will get you from A to B, are you really at that final goal? And if you are, then you're supporting kind of what you set up at the beginning and you're able to remove that impairment or that beneficial use impairment. And so sometimes though, that isn't the case. You can actually also uh, go past a couple of those steps so when an when a impairment was designated back in 1987, times were different back then. Uh, over time, as water quality has improved and other uh, factors within our urban area that have gotten better, um, those, those things have changed over time, not necessarily directly related to the AOC program, but within all of our partners of our watershed and wanting to address surface water pollution and, and being able to meet uh, team DL standards and water quality criteria, you're actually able to skip the process of implementing projects and to see if, based on when the target was set, if you're able to meet it without having to do projects. And if that's the case, then you can go to formal removal um, based on that data. And so one of the things that I'll talk about now um, after that is, if that isn't the case, if you do have to do projects, who, who determines what a management action is? What is a management action? I think one of the things that it's hard to understand sometimes is that the management actions, the projects that the AOC is doing is specific for those targets that you set, right? And so an area of concern management action um, is based on your baseline monitoring or your investigation work that you did and your targets that you set based on that. And so, Area of concern management actions are though very science-based, um, but they also are feasible. And so that's usually a really hard uh, gray line to follow when you know you want everything in the kitchen sink, but in reality, what you end up doing is is moving you out of an F and you're able to move further up and be able to get the to a, a standard that you're able to continue to improve but the AOC program is to kind of get you out of that, that hole and to get you further, um, further along than you would have been already. So that your a management action can be one to address a target, or it can be a, a, a whole list of management actions to address different portions of those targets. And so through implementing management actions, um, you get to eventual uh, impairment removal 
and you can you can delist the area of concern once you have removed all of your impairments. And so one of the one of the parts of this process that is really important also to understand is that while this is very simplified, um, there's a lot of steps and, and <laughs> um, standardized processes that, that go on through this, um, whether that is uh, engaging the public through all these different steps or talking with a set list of stakeholder groups that have been determined to help you out through that based on their technical expertise. And so the state really relies on our partnerships to be able to get through this process, to be able to show support of removing these impairments and then being able to eventually delist the area of concern. And so after going through that kind of area of concern 101 uh, explanation, we're gonna jump right into Milwaukee. And so the Milwaukee Estuary AOC is fairly large. Um, it covers, uh, three different rivers, it covers an inner and outer harbor, it covers the near shore waters of what we refer to sometimes as the Milwaukee Bay. And within our area of concern, we have uh, 11 designated beneficial use impairments. The reason why they're colored on the screen is to make it a little bit easier. I normally try to categorize or explain them in the way that they're categorized into three different um, groups. So the, the, the first one, the brown colored impairments are normally um, addressed through sediment management actions or um, legacy cleanup work. Um, there's been a couple of those projects already done within Milwaukee. Um, the other, the next set is our fish and wildlife uh, projects or our impairments, our, our parents and projects to address those impairments. And then the third one is uh, water quality. And so you can kind of see just from reading some of those names, you don't have to be super familiar with them, but it kind of makes sense that if you were to address kind of that, you know, generalized name, you could probably get at removing some of those impairments based on those targets. And so one of the things um, as part of doing this and how you can be able to address those impairments is coordination and communication through partnerships. And so with my position that I do, um, I think it was referenced within um, the invitation to this, this presentation discussion is that I'm the glue that holds it all together, um, which is pretty much true. There's a lot of work that's going on and being able to communicate effectively to all the different groups that are trying to kind of uh, get, come together and address all this at once is really important. And so this is the a general structure um, diagram that you'll see um, that we have set up for the Milwaukee AOC in that we really like our technical work groups and our teams and um, everyone that can be able to take part in that and to really provide um, their expertise and an opinion on being able to how to address um, all these impairments and the projects that we need to do to address them. And so I did a quick count um, on a standing list that we have for all of our uh, charters um, for all these different groups and it's around 120 plus individuals representing 20 or more organizations throughout the area of concern. Um, majority of those organizations are those that we work with um, through all these different teams that you see um, through this, this partnership structure. Um, and I think what we've been doing more recently um, is really trying to have, since there's so much work happening, is to have an effective communication uh, voice out through the AOC program. So any projects that are happening, um, any type of monitoring work that's going on, all of that that is communicated uh, outside of those project teams, um, all that communication goes through our outreach team. So it has the same message. It's all under the same umbrella. People are able to, to, to make sure that we're all saying the same thing as we move through all this work. And so that is, I think, one of the biggest take homes as part of this presentation is just all the people that are part of this, these efforts to be able to um, address these impairments because I definitely couldn't do it by myself. Um, so I kind of want to hone in more onto the planning portion um, of this partnership. So one of the technical work groups that we have within the area of concern um, that I facilitate with my position is called the Fish and Wildlife Technical Advisory Committee. 
This committee focuses on our fish and wildlife impairments, as you can imagine. Um, and so for the past, well, it's now 2021, but um, for around a year total, um, this group was trying to figure out what that removal criteria or what those targets should be for our one of our impairments, the degradation of fish and wildlife populations, BY. And so through all of that baseline assessment work that was done um, by UWM Field Station and Milwaukee County Parks, um, there was recommendations for what that criteria should be and a lot of discussion within this technical committee on what is our status of, of this impairment. And then based on that status, what, what projects do we need to do to be able to address that? And so it was a long, a long year. Uh, I calculated it out to be around 2021 20, meetings, most of the time, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and all the people that attended those meetings volunteered their time to talk through this process, um, which totaled to be around with everyone's time included around 2,500 hours. Um, so it's, it's definitely not a, a short process and uh, it's very science-based to come out to what those management actions should be. And so if anyone wants to, um, feel free to look online. Uh, you can Google search like Milwaukee AOC DNR and, and look for our resources tab. And we have a bunch of um, previous remedial action plans. And so in 2018 to 2019, we, we published one um, that refers back to that process in more detail than I could probably give today during this presentation. Um, but it really lays out on how we kind of walked through that and got to our list of our projects. But um, I will try just to show some visuals, um, but I'm definitely probably won't go into very specific details. So when that started and the baseline assessment work was completed, there was around 120 projects that were proposed throughout the entire area of concern and it was split up by geographical region. Um, and so each of the, the rivers um, were split up and also which type of species that you needed to address to, to get at your um, status of your impairment and to improve it. And so this is a map um, of those project areas, um, all of those proposed locations. And so the, the tech team or the technical committee walked through each of those individual sites, all 120 of them, and, and walked through which one would be a high, medium, or low priority. And through that um, effort, 34 of those originally 120 ended up being a high priority. And so from all of those intricate discussions, um, we pared down our list even further based on our status, based on our impairment status. And so we were able to say, if you implement this project, this is what you'll get out of it. This is what you will enhance. And therefore we ended up getting to a list of projects at the end. Um, which is a very brief explanation for $2,500 worth of work. Um, but to show you kind of what that came out to be, um, this is a, a, a map of those locations of those projects. Um, they're numbered one through 15 based on how many ended up being determined as needed. Um, and then uh, this is another map for the other list of projects that the tech team actually um, decided before my time as the AOC coordinator. But just to show you that the list of projects for both of those um, went through a similar process um, and kind of which ones are underway right now versus which ones haven't started versus which ones are completed. And so when you're thinking about the area of concern, um, while it's the sediment remediation component to it, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is really interesting. There's, there's a lot other a lot of other projects happening that are all under that same umbrella. Um, a lot of people are probably familiar with the Burnham Canal Wetland Restoration Project or closer to the school, the Grand Trunk Wetland Restoration Project. All of those projects are all under these, these two impairments. Um, and so uh, I think a total list of 26 projects um, that fall under the, the fish and wildlife impairments. And now moving on um, to what probably a lot of people are interested in is the Wisconsin uh, cleanups and as well as how the Milwaukee AOC is really striving to, to clean up the area of concern for, for legacy contaminated material. Um, so this is a, a slide that shows um, thousands of cubic yards of material um, based on site. 
and in in orange um, to your left, the two columns there are areas within Milwaukee that still need to be addressed. And so if you're comparing a certain section of the Milwaukee River, which is the tallest uh, column there over 600,000 cubic yards to an entire cleanup that happened in like the Sheboygan area of concern or others, um, there's a lot of material out there that needs to be addressed. And so if anyone's wondering what MR REACH4 stands for, it stands for this area um, within the AOC, which is the most urbanized downtown stretch that you could think of, um, which for those that understand lake dynamics, it makes sense um, as the lake um, impacts all the way up to around the four, former North Avenue Dam on the Milwaukee River. Um, so as that sediment is coming through, um, it kind of slows down and settles out along the bottom within the stretch and deposits um, on top of the, the surface of the sediment and has been there um, since it's been dumped into our waterways. Um, so as I said, this is the largest uh, known volume of, of contamination to date within the AOC. It's around 600 to 700,000 cubic yards of material um, and about two and a half miles of river. Um, I think the one of the hardest parts of needing to be able to tackle this stretch is understanding that there's a lot of things to take in cons into consideration beyond just the contaminated material. You have 18 bridges and row crossings. You have uh, shoreline stability issues, most likely next to high rise buildings. You can't necessarily dig out all of the material right next to those, those sheet piling walls. Um, you have river walks, you have private docks, you have outfall locations from CSOs. Um, there's just a large complexity for this area, the stretch of the river, um, once you start really thinking about it. And so how does, how does this area specifically compare um, in Milwaukee as a whole for the remaining cleanup work to other locations throughout Wisconsin? Um, so on the, uh, or other locations throughout uh, yeah, Wisconsin. So on the far left-hand side um, is the Fox River cleanup. Um, that took a little over 15 years to clean up and they addressed 6 million cubic yards of material, um, which was upwards of a, over a billion dollars um, when it was all said and done through all their responsible parties um, and the legacy work. Um, Milwaukee, uh, we have around a third of that amount um, within Milwaukee remaining, and we're looking to complete it um, in less than five years. Um, and I'll get at how that could be potentially possible. And so just a, a brief snapshot of our historic remediation within Milwaukee. Um, the one that's highlighted there is our Kinnikinnick River legacy cleanup work that happened in 2009, um, which was the, the largest volume of material that came out. Um, but it also was the cheapest amount uh, per cubic yard, being that all of that material was able to be um, disposed of and managed at the dredge material management facility. If those are, that are familiar with that's located, it's located just north of um, the uh, car ferry um, area off of Jones Island. Um, and being that it was a lower cost is because it was able to take advantage of things that you normally wouldn't be able to do if you uh, have to handle the material multiple times to to move to take it out of the river to put it into a barge to take that material to an offloading platform to take the material out to treat it to have it settled to put it back into a truck and, and to ship it off to a landfill um, it actually was able uh, to to pick up that material and put it directly into that facility as a final holding place um, and not necessarily having to pay for uh, disposal tipping fees that you normally would have to per per cubic yard or ton of material. So, so that kind of sparks some ideas um, that you'll see further on um, as part of this work. And so if we're, if we're talking about the, the, expanse, the expansive area that still needs to be addressed, um, there's kind of a, a generalized map um, of all those locations within the AOC for contaminated sediment. Totals around 10.9 miles of, of river. Um, so when you're, when you're thinking about, wow, that's a large area, you know, 2 million cubic yards of material, five years, how is this possible? Um, so through uh, long discussions within what we call our sediment technical work group um, for our area of concern, but also with, uh, within the DNR and with the EPA, um, talking through kind of what the problem is, right? 
millions of cubic yards of material, short timeline, wanting to be able to complete it within action plan three that uh, EPA releases every five years um, that called out Milwaukee as being potentially a priority area of concern. Um, there's multiple rivers, multiple project areas, multiple partners that are cleaning up those project areas. Um, the remediation has to occur in various stages. There's not a lot of responsible parties, which is uh, kind of unique for Milwaukee and that 90 to 95% of the contamination is orphaned, meaning that there isn't anyone kind of on the hook to clean it up. Um, so it would be extremely costly for, for one organization to kind of to brunt those costs. Um, so talking through the solutions. So being in Milwaukee and having a lot of partners um, that can really uh, be able to, to get together to, to figure out how to address this, uh, it really came down to cost sharing and figuring out what everyone uh, is doing within the area of concern to address uh, contaminated material, whether it's a source or, or whether it is um, uh, been there for a while. Um, but thinking it from a holistic approach, which um, has never been done in the Great Lakes before, of putting all of your projects under one agreement with EPA, saying that if you do work uh, within one river, whether that's you know the Milwaukee Menominee or the Kinnickinnick River, if you do work within one river, you can then leverage federal dollars in a different river. Normally, that's not the case. Normally, it's you, you pay for, for your project area, but since we were able to think of it from a holistic approach, we were able to leverage um, and scale our, leverage our partnership and scale the remediation to reduce the overall cost of the cleanup. And so in, if anyone uh, follows the news, in, in January of 2020, we signed a project agreement, uh, we meaning DNR, with other non-federal sponsors such as uh, MMSD, We Energy, City of Milwaukee, and Milwaukee County Parks with uh, the US EPA to cover the initial stages of, of this larger cleanup work, um, which ended up being around $29 million. Um, so through that agreement, it basically says us non-federal sponsors will be able to support um, through the Great Lakes Legacy Act, 35% of of these initial stages of work, while EPA, as per that act, uh, cost shares um, that, that work at 65%. So being able to pull all of those resources together as one was, was really big. Um, and so through doing that, there was uh, uh, analysis that was done to figure out, well, what, how does, how does you know, taking this material to a, a disposal facility versus a landfill, how does that differ in cost? And, and how can you really get at being able to, to make it efficient and safe um, and not necessarily take up you know, over one and a half times the largest landfill in Wisconsin within two years. Um, so one of the things that was proposed was uh, constructing, a, a, it's referred to as a dredged material management facility. Um, the idea of, of a confined disposal facility similar to this in the Great Lakes is not unusual. Um, there's 45 uh, confined disposal facilities in the Great Lakes, six of which are built um, along shorelines of Wisconsin. Um, and over 90 million cubic yards have been placed historically throughout CDFs, um, but mostly for navigational and commercial dredging by uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, but only five Legacy Act projects, such as the Kinnicknick River one that I referenced earlier, have actually been able to dispose of that contaminated material into CDFs, which only totals up to short of uh, 900,000 cubic yards. So when you're talking about what they're normally used for, they're not used for this type of legacy cleanup. They're used for you know, navigational and maintenance dredging within harbors. Um, so kind of using that idea and looking at a cost estimation um, and going through the numbers uh, based on previous work that's been done uh, throughout the Great Lakes Basin, there was an analysis that was done to figure out what those differences are in cost and how that can be um, environmentally safe and sustainable long term. Um, and so it really was able to uh, save costs uh, primarily on uh, being able to construct and build, design, construct, and build one of the uh, a newer facility, safe costs on sediment processing, 
infrastructure, handling materials, like I referenced before, um, as well as water treatment and trucking to a landfill and paying disposing tipping fees. So the difference that came out of that was around $170 million, 107, sorry, million dollars difference between the two. And so through a 45 day public comment period, uh, the DNR recommended that we uh, pursue that with our partners as part of this uh, larger project agreement. And so that's kind of what it would, what it currently looks like in the design stage um, on where it would be located, just uh, adjacent to and north of the current confined disposal facility that the Army Corps of Engineers uses for navigation dredging and that the Port of Milwaukee uses and has some space for, for commercial dredging. Um, and then this is kind of where it would be located based on a, a drone image um, around 42 acres and would hold upwards of 1.9 million cubic yards of material. And if I always like to put some comparisons in here. So volume wise, um, once the, the walls would be constructed to it and it would kind of act like a big swimming pool, um, how many Olympic swimming pools could you fit in there, right? So uh, 581 Olympic swimming pools could fit into it, um, but surface area, how many, you know, Lambeau fields, um, could you fit on their football fields um, around 32? So it's a pretty pretty large area, um, but uh, it's it's the way in which it was constructed and designed, and I can go through that more after this if people are interested. Um, but it it it's structurally safe to the point in which it kind of acts like you know uh, a management material holding facility um, to be able to contain. Uh, material in a way in which you're not uh, filling up uh, inland landfill, but also um, saving costs on not transporting it that far away. Um, and so with that, um, I think the takeaway, a part of all of this um, is that in order to achieve this, this large goal and the, uh, the big push um, to address a lot of these impairments within the AOC, is having uh, a wonderful list of partners and being able to, to show that each one of them has skin in the game and that they're contributing um, to the efforts that are happening in, for at least for this cleanup work around $130 million um, worth, of, worth of in kind or cash contributions um, are expected as part of our non federal sponsors, but also being able to have a cohesive plan for addressing the sediment contamination. Um, and being able to really scale it up and to reduce your overall costs of, of addressing it, but also allowing the facility that is proposed for construction to be eventually used um, for the Port of Milwaukee to, to aid um, in shipping and, and, and birthing of ships and, and docking um, to be able to, to really develop um, the, the industry for shipping with throughout the port um, is, is a big one, but also having, um, an existing project agreement and unique throughout all the Great Lakes in which uh, Milwaukee was the first one to be able to leverage uh, project to project um, work. And then finding, finally being able to reduce uh, time and cost, um, being able to do it all at once versus in a piecemeal fashion um, is definitely an important one to note. And so with that, I know I went through that pretty quickly and I know I might be a little bit late on time, um, but I will open it up for some discussion and questions. Um, and I'm gonna drag my thing back here. Great, thank you, Brennan. That was really wide ranging and mm -hmm. a great overview. And I know I have a lot of questions and I'm sure other people do too. Um, at this point, we're gonna stop the recording. And uh, Brennan, if you...